as I mentioned, uh, I have been bringing a series of messages on healing for, I don't know, a number of weeks now. Uh, last week, Jeff Canfield filled the pulpit and uh, dashed all of your hopes for an easy out uh, during the tribulation with his message on the last trumpet, which he continued on Wednesday. Uh, we'll be having, I won't name the speaker yet, but we'll be having him in soon for a rebuttal. I'm kidding, we're not going to do that. We're not going to turn this into a debate society. But check those messages out. Very, very interesting, very, very challenging. Uh, a last days stuff, right? But uh, before that, uh, I brought, I don't know, number, at least, five, at least five or six messages on healing in this series. And I am not done talking about healing. I feel like, honestly, we could keep going for a while, but I'm going to wrap up this series this morning. Again, it's not because uh, I've said everything there is to say on the subject, not, not, uh, not by a long shot. You know, one of the reasons I've mentioned this a few times, that I find it more than appropriate to spend this kind of time on one subject, in this case, well, on this subject the subject of divine healing, is that it was such a central part of what Jesus did during his earthly ministry. We put a great deal of emphasis on healing because Jesus put a great deal of emphasis on healing, right? Right? When I ask a question, I, I, I try not to be the guy that says, come on, say amen, somebody shout, somebody shout hallelujah. But when I say right, you have to say right, or we understand, right? I just need to know you're, you're listening. Okay. Always remember, at the core of Jesus' ministry, whether he was teaching, preaching, or healing, what he was about was showing us the Father. We talked about that when he was uh, preparing his disciples for his departure. And they, they oh, show us the Father, and that's enough. If you, you've been with me all this time, believe me, you've seen the Father. You want to know how God responds to anything? Look how I respond to that thing. And look how God responds. You want to know how God responds to sickness? Look at my healing ministry. In this series, and if you've missed it, or any message in it, I want to encourage you to go find those messages online, listen to them. We've covered things like the connection between sin and forgiveness with healing, faith for healing, healing miracles, healing and the atonement, God's will to heal, why Jesus healed, different methods like laying on of hands, anointing with oil, etc. And a lot of things, and a lot about what qualifies us for healing in the first place. And along the way, We've had some testimonies of healing, and we'll hear some more in the near future. And just because I'm wrapping up this series today doesn't mean that healing won't come up until I do another series or another message specifically about it. It always comes up, and, it with, and it'll come up often in relation to other subjects and other sermons, and we will, of course, continue to pray for the sick and emphasize God's will to heal. Today, though, I want to talk about a couple of things that are intertwined, starting with what we should do once we have experienced the manifestation of our healing. There's no shame or condemnation if you can't raise your hand at this, but I do want, you, I do want to see how many of you can say categorically you can point to at least one time in your life when you were healed and there was nothing involved except the power of God, and your faith in the power of God. That is the majority of people in here. Now, it's one thing to say, well, I prayed, and I went to the doctor, and I took medicine, and we are not against those things. I'm talking about the only way you know, you know the only way you were healed was through the power of God. I have two, all right? And, and that's exciting. And we should testify when that happens. But once we have experienced that, a couple of things happen, or maybe should happen, or maybe shouldn't happen. A couple of things happen. One is, I can speak from my experience, and if we have time, I kind of don't think we will, but if, we, if I get through this faster than I think I do, I'm going to share once again my healing testimony from my back. I've referred to it several times, and I've referred to pieces of it, but I haven't shared that story, I don't think, in, in, in a, at least a couple of years. But again, probably won't get to it. I will simply tell you that I experienced a miraculous healing of sciatica, a crippling episode of sciatica that I experienced healing from. And that serves as an anchor when I am facing something else. When you have experienced what can only be attributed to God, that is, we, should, we don't need that proof because we have the word of God, but once you've experienced that, that is one more solid piece 
of something that you can point to and say, he's done it before, I've experienced it, I know it from the word, and I know it ex uh, experientially. This happened to me. Okay? But another thing that can happen is, if once we experience that, and then sickness comes again, whether it's something else or a return of the same thing, this is part of my testimony. I was healed of sciatica and almost exactly a year later was slammed with a much worse case of sciatica. Then what do we do? There's a, there are two questions we're looking at today. How do I keep my healing once I receive it? And how do I respond if sickness returns? Okay? Now, so the first thing is, what should we do once we have experienced the manifestation of our healing? And the short answer is this, be thankful. The slightly longer answer is always stay thankful. And that's kind of what we're exploring here because to always stay thankful is to walk in a constant awareness and appreciation of the truth that it is God who healed you that it is God who heals us, and every day we walk in the manifestation of any of his blessings is a day that we should not only be experiencing, experiencing a sense of gratitude, but a day that we should be expressing that gratitude out loud to God. Let me go straight to the heart of this, which is the message of the word of faith. In the spirit realm, in the realm of faith, the promise is as real as the manifestation. One of the great keys to receiving healing and, uh, is to be genuinely thankful for the promise of healing and the provision of healing before you see it manifested in your body. I've shared this example before, and I love it, so I'm going to share it again. And many of you know this without me sharing it. But um, World War II. World War II was raging before the United States got involved in World War II, right? But when the uh, Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor... There were, people, there were people all over the world, but there were people particularly in Europe who rejoiced. Winston Churchill among them. Why? Why did they rejoice? They didn't rejoice because, ha ha, uh, bad things happened to American servicemen. They rejoiced because when that happened, they knew at that moment that the United States, without question, would declare war on the Axis powers. And they knew that the United States getting involved in the war meant an allied victory. They knew it. We had a while. We, had, we, we, had, we were still ramping up our, our uh, materials production for war, still uh, training people. We weren't quite ready to dive 100% into the fray, but suddenly they declare war on us. We have to go to war. And they knew that the economic and military might and everything that we could bring to that uh, that war meant an allied victory. Victory was still years away, but in the minds of many of those people, it was a foregone conclusion. Literally, all that was left to do was the fighting. The outcome wasn't in doubt. The cheering would happen again on VE Day and VJ Day. It was because when the manifestation of the victory came, that was worth celebrating. But there was genuine relief and joy and gratitude just because America declared war on their enemies. We know how it's going to turn out. That's how we should feel. That's how we should react simply upon finding a promise in God's word. This is related, and we're going to look at some scriptures, don't worry. Uh, this is related uh, to how we keep our healing and what to do uh, when sickness returns. But sticking with the war analogy, once a victory was won, when the war was over, a military presence was established in different places around the globe to keep the peace and to make it easy to respond more quickly to threats when they arose. Leaders had to have to insist upon a high state of readiness, a high state of training, uh, during times of peace, so that our military could respond effectively in times of war. And I submit to you 
that mo- one of the most effective ways that you and I can stay ready for any battle is to be constantly and consciously thankful and to be expressing that thankfulness. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures here, and we're going to start with my old buddy King Asa. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on him because we looked at his story a little over a year ago in a different context, but I do return to him often because his story is such a powerful example for us. And you can read about him in 1 Kings chapter 15 and in 2 Chronicles chapters 14 through 16 if you want all the details. We are going to read uh, out of 2 Chronicles this morning because it is a more detailed account, but again, we're only looking at a few highlights. The background is this is in the days of the divided kingdom. Uh, after a, a peer, after you know, hundreds of years uh, of living under the judges, after the, the children of Israel began to inhabit the land of promise, uh, the monarchy was established. The first king was King Saul, and then it was King David, then King David's son Solomon, and then when Solomon died, the kingdom of Israel was divided. There was a tax revolt, essentially, and it was divided into the northern kingdom of Israel, and they had their king, and the southern kingdom of Judah, and they had their king. The Davidic lineage, uh, the, the lineage of King David was the southern kingdom. And this period of time is covered in... Uh, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, but 1st and 2nd Chronicles focuses on the southern kingdom of Judah, okay? So we get a closer look at the kings of Judah, and there were good ones and bad ones, mostly bad ones, but King Asa was one of the early kings of the southern kingdom, and he was a good one. And we see that right off the bat, because early in his reign, he instituted a number of reforms that were aimed primarily at cleansing the land from idol worship, pagan practices. He also uh, built and established uh, fortified cities to prepare for anything that, that their enemies might be planning. And for 10 years, he just continued that way, being a good king, preparing the land, leading, you know, this... Uh, uh, so that they were also, they weren't just military re- uh, militarily ready. His focus was on them being morally right before God. And then, 10 years into his reign, he was attacked. Judah was attacked, or advanced upon, by, a, uh, by an army of a million soldiers from Ethiopia, outnumbering his army about two to one. And God himself defeated the Ethiopians before them, All Israel's army had to do, excuse me, Judah's army had to do, was chase them and collect the spoil. Because King Asa led his people out there and and threw the whole battle on God. He says, it's not up to how many people we have. It's not up to who has the better chariots or better weapons. You're God. You've decided this battle. Show yourself strong. And he did. He wiped this army out. And again, they they started running away. And they went up, they picked up the spoil and brought it back. Yay. After at returning from battle, this, this always fascinates me because a prophet meets him, a prophet named Azariah, and he has this encounter. And if you are a Bible reader, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, you know what usually happens when a prophet comes to meet a king or a judge or a leader. He's got a word for him, and it's usually a rebuke, a correction, even a pronouncement of judgment. In this case, Azariah comes out to meet King Asa, and his message is essentially this. Good job. Keep it up. That's the kind of prophet I need in my life, man. That's the kind of prophet I want in my life, right? Good job. Keep it up. So he did. He kept it up for 25 years. Encouraged by what he had seen on the battlefield, And by the word of the prophet, he redoubled his efforts to rid the land of idols. He encouraged wholehearted worship of Jehovah. And during all that time, 25 years, there was peace. There was rest in the land. No wars. And then in the 36th year of his reign, he was attacked by the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. War had come to him, not because of anything he did wrong. But it came. After 25 years of peace and favor with God, 
Now we have war. He's being attacked. Now put yourself in his shoes. What would you do? Now reading this, reading this whole account in just a couple of pages of the Bible, to me makes the choice look easy. Hey man, you just saw, just two pages ago, you saw God defeat an army that's much more powerful than the one Israel is bringing against you. And you hardly had to lift a finger. And your whole life since then has been a display of God's favor and his blessings upon your life and your reign. Just do what you did before. Does that make sense? Okay, I still think that's the correct answer. The problem is, Asa wasn't going through this in two pages. It had been 25 years. What Asa did was to seek out the king of Syria, and he paid the king of Syria with treasure from the temple, the temple of God. He takes gold and silver from God's house, delivers it to the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and says, hey, go make war with Israel. Get them off my back. And he does. Syria was an enemy in God's eyes. They had not been actively fighting. God was keeping uh, Israel's enemy, or Judah's enemies, uh, off their back. But there was an enemy, and this, this was something that God never would have approved of. Asa took God's money and gave it to an enemy so that he wouldn't have to fight Israel himself. And then another prophet showed up. This time it was Hanani, the seer. And we can read, and you can turn there. Where did I say we were? Second Chronicles, right? We're in Second Chronicles chapter 16. And we'll begin in verse 7. And at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not relied on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars." Now, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is in that. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth that he may show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him or whose heart is completely his. I love that because it speaks to this difference between me having to say, Yo, God, I need some help here. Notice me. Let me fast. Let me afflict myself so that I can get your attention on me so that you can deliver me. No, this verse says God is actively looking for somebody whose heart belongs to him just so he can show himself strong on their behalf. That is a truth. Even taken out of context, that is still true. It's just sad to see it delivered in this context. Asa, you didn't have to do what you did. You knew better than that. You knew who Syria was. You knew they were an enemy, and God had plans to deliver them into your hand. But you did foolishly here. You didn't have to do it. You think God didn't see Israel coming? You think God didn't have a plan for you to defeat Israel, just like he did the Ethiopians? They were bigger than Israel. Don't you know that God is actively looking to show himself strong on your behalf? And you didn't turn to him. You've acted foolishly. From now on, you will have wars. What does this have to do with healing? Before I explain that last part. I can't totally... Did you say amen? Like, where are you going with this? (laughs) I can't totally get inside Ace's head. But the way it reads to me is something like this. I experienced supernatural deliverance from an enemy. I did everything I knew to do for 25 years to honor God who worked that deliverance in me. I experienced blessings and peace for those 25 years and war came anyway. I guess I'll try something else this time. We might say, I experienced a supernatural healing from God. 
And I didn't turn from him after that. I continued to live for him. I went to church. I did my devotions. I shared the gospel. I paid my tithes. And essentially did everything I knew to do to live as a Christian, and I got sick again anyway. I guess I'll try something else this time. How about instead this? I got sick one time, really sick, and God healed me. But later I got sick again. So I turned to God again, and I got healed again. Look, Asa was doing a good job before Ethiopia attacked the first time. And I don't see any indication. He had 10 years of these reforms and being blessed. And then here comes Ethiopia with their million-man army. And I don't see Asa saying, what? Why, God? I've been a good king. I've cleansed the land of idols. I've taken down the high places. I've reinstituted these feasts. Why is this happening to me? No, he just says, look, God, you're our God. Take, the, take these guys out. And he does. Why didn't he do the same thing that he did 25 years ago? Only two reasons I can think of. And I'm sure I don't see everything, but these are the two reasons that jump off the page at me. One is this. Nobody likes a fight. We don't relish the idea of a struggle. And the second one is this. There's a difference between 10 years and 25 years. Do you know what I mean? 25 years is a long time to get used to resting and not fighting. Let me jump ahead before I jump back to this. I'm just going to read three short scripture passages. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, you can jot these down. You don't have to turn to them because, again, I'm just reading one little verse. In 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Romans 8, verse 37, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Victory triumph, conquerors. Now these are not, as I mentioned during the offering, those three verses are not in their context about healing specifically, but they are broad, inclusive statements. Victory, triumph, conquerors, always causes us to triumph, more than conquerors in all these things. It's important to know that God always decrees your victory, your triumph, your conquering in all these things. It's just as important to remember that there is no triumph without adversity. There is no conquering without an enemy, and there's no victory without a battle. We must remember that God never promised we wouldn't face adversity, wouldn't face an enemy, wouldn't face a fight. He simply promises us victory. He doesn't cause all sickness to cease to exist but he does promise healing. Back to 2 Chronicles. Hanani was not telling Asa that he would be punished with wars because of what he did, because of his failure. He was saying that wars were now going to come more frequently to keep Asa on his toes and walking in a state of preparation and not forget how to respond. You see the difference? Do you? You had 25 years of peace, and suddenly you forgot how to respond to war. So it's not going to be 25 years now. You're going to have wars. He didn't say, he didn't say I'm bringing in these enemies to wipe you out, to defeat you. He said you're going to have wars. You're going to remember how to fight. I'm not saying that God's plan for you <laughs> is to make you sick frequently so that you can remember how to get healed. That is not it. I am saying that in the midst of those 25 years, maybe Asa neglected to be specifically thankful and conscious of the fact that it was God who was keeping the peace. We keep our healing by being continually thankful for it, by being continually 
purposely conscious of the fact that God is the one who healed us, is the one who heals us. Look at what happened next. Second Chronicles still, chapter 16, verse 10. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him because of this, and Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Skip to verse 12. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but the physicians. So Asa rested with his fathers. He died in the 41st year of his reign. Asa was a good king. I would say Asa was even a great king. But he died pouting. God wasn't withholding healing from Asa and his nasty feet. Asa refused to seek God for that healing. Because he was pouting. And let me just emphasize, he wasn't condemned for seeking physicians. He, was, he wasn't healed because he refused to involve God in it. The prophet offers this correction. And again, the, what the prophet said was harsh, but it wasn't condemnation across the board. It wasn't a proclamation of future defeat. It's just that, hey, if you're going to forget how to fight, I'm going to have to allow you to fight a little more often. He didn't like it. He got so mad he threw the prophet in jail. That was so disappointing to read because he had been such a good king for so long and suddenly he could turn into somebody like Ahab and imprison the prophet for speaking the word of God. And not only that, he began to oppress some of his own people. And then he got a disease in his feet. Now, I've seen it. You've seen it. Everybody probably has seen it. That somebody who has wandered away from God, it, takes, it might take something difficult, something tragic. People say some people have to hit rock bottom before they turn to God. You end up wasting a lot of time and money and energy that way. Okay, it's better to be corrected and turn to God. Some people, though, they get sick. So it won't get, nothing will get their attention except, I might die. And then they cry out to God. Isn't it interesting? I should have had it in my notes. That I read a psalm a couple weeks ago, where it says, you know, we are afflicted because of our iniquity, yet when we cried out to you, you heard our call. He sent his word and healed them. He healed our affliction, even though our affliction was due to our iniquity. Now, some people, when they're faced with this, might be life-threatening, certainly is, 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 is destroying their health. Some people will be humble enough to turn to God and say, God, I've messed up. Doctors don't know what to do with me. I need healing. I need a touch from you. I need wisdom. I need your help. And God reaches into that situation, takes that affliction away. Asa didn't do that. He didn't do that, did he? Asa's just like, not until the prophet takes it back. I don't need God. If he's not just going to bless me, I don't need him. And you're going to stand on a, on a weak principle like that and die of foot disease. It's sick. It's sad. How many times, though, have we flirted with that mindset by thinking, if God, real, if God really healed me, then why did I get sick again? Surely, if God healed me, I would stay healed. And I think the answer is God saying, I'm still here. Healing is still yours. But there's still an enemy. He's still active. He's still, he's still trying to steal your healing. But you don't have to let him take it. Conquer. Triumph. Know that victory is yours. Look at this. Nail down this point some more. This is from Judges chapter 3. This is a few hundred years before Asa. A few hundred years before the monarchy itself, in fact. We're told in Joshua that the children of Israel began to inhabit the land. You remember, they entered the land of promise under Joshua, and they, and they fought the battle of Jericho. Sorry, they fit the battle of Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. And the walls came tumbling down. And then they went on 
uh, it, it's, Judges is another fascinating book when you read about how they divided the land and how they moved into it. And God said at one point, uh, I'm going to remove the inhabitants of the land. And there's a whole story there that we don't have time to get into today. You think, boy, is that fair that God just pushed these other people out to make room for his people? And you read about the evil that was going on in this land and how patient God was and how he gave them 400 years to repent and he didn't. So God was using the fulfillment of his promise to his people, Israel, to execute judgment on people who refused to bow their knee and turn from their wicked ways. Anyway, he said, I'm going to remove the the current inhabitants of that land Little by little, not all at once. And one of the early reasons he gave them is, if I chased them all out now, then between now and the time you inhabit the land, the weeds would grow up, it would choke out all these crops and these vineyards and everything else, and wild animals would take over. I'm going to leave the enemy there just long enough to maintain it before you move in. It's a pretty sweet deal. Here we get another reason. In Judges chapter 3, Beginning in verse 1, we read this. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the, pre- of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. The land was theirs, but there were enemies around them, and they would still have to contend for it. But they had a promise. They were victorious through God, but God left those nations around them so that they would never forget how to fight in his strength. He never wanted his children to forget how to make war. They always had to be ready to fight. They were always... They were set as a city on a hill. They had God's blessing. They had God's protection. They had God's promise. They had all of this stuff, but surrounded by enemies. They always had to realize they had to rely on God and submit themselves to him to stay in that place of protection and provision and victory. They were capable of going into each battle with the same unified faith and the confidence they had at Jericho, knowing that victory was a foregone conclusion, but still having to fight. We have been given that same kind of promise, that same capability. We don't relish the prospect of a battle but we should engage the enemy knowing that victory is a foregone conclusion. We should rejoice at the promise. Like like Churchill rejoiced when when, uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. It's all over now. All over now but the fight. We still have to fight, but we know where this is going. And if the enemy comes back, the promise remains. Oh no, another battle? Guess what? Another victory. It's not easy, but it is that straightforward in terms of the word of God. What's the key for us? What are we doing in between the battles? Thank him. I do believe that the more humble we are and the more vocally and sincerely thankful we are daily, for our health and healing, as well as every other blessing in our lives, the fewer battles we'll have to actually fight. And here's what I think. I can't prove this. It's the way it strikes me. If Asa had responded to Israel, the northern kingdom, coming in to invade his land, the same way he had responded to to Ethiopia, then the land might have had rest for another 50 years. You see that? There's rest for 10 years, a battle. He responds with faith in God. Then there's rest for 25 years. Then there's a battle. He responds in fear. And now it shortens the time to the next battle. Had Asa responded correctly, who knows? Maybe an extra 25, maybe, maybe 40 years before the next one, maybe 50. I don't know doesn't matter too much to me because the main thing is knowing that a battle or an attack is not an indication of your failure or a manifestation of judgment. It's often just an indication that you are a threat to the enemy. 
He, why, why would the enemy bother to attack you in the first place? If you were down and out, you're not out. I'm talking about being thankful. And it's November, and that means, according to the Bible, we need to focus on Thanksgiving. That's not how it works, but we are going to do that anyway for the next few weeks, so stay tuned. I'm going to, we're not doing this right this second, so don't get up yet. I am going to lay my hands on the sick today. And you should know by now that God does not limit himself uh, to a particular methodology when it comes to healing. You can receive your healing by confessing your healing, speaking it over yourself in faith. You can do that at home. You can receive it in a healing line, uh, anointing with oil, whatever. It's not one or the other. I do have time. Do you care? Uh, and bear with me, those of you who've heard it once, twice, or a dozen times. I couldn't tell you the exact year. Uh, the, f the first time I had a, uh, a severe attack of sciatica, and I'm not going to go into all the details of the pain uh, other than to tell you it was literally crippling. Beth will testify to this. Uh, walking, standing up, I could not put my, my shoes on, couldn't put my socks on, I couldn't bend, I couldn't find a way to get comfortable. And it hit me very suddenly. I had had little twinges and little, ooh boy, kind of... But, but there was one day when I woke up when I could not put my foot on the ground because there was a pain in the ball of my foot, my calf, my hip, and my back. It was, it was a sciatic nerve, and it was the most horrific pain I had ever experienced. And one thing I did right off the bat was go into a battle mode where I began speaking my healing, standing on scriptures, quoting the healing promises, claiming it, speaking to my body, and I would, uh, I would assume a posture of prayer. I would get as comfortable as I could so that the pain wouldn't be a greater distraction than it needed to be. Uh, and that usually meant having my knees on a pillow and hunched over uh, face down in the cushions of the couch early, early in the morning, and I would just speak. And I beg you to believe me, that for the week or maybe week and a half it took, uh, it, was a, it was a struggle because the pain didn't go away right away. But I never felt a moment of despair. Even in the midst of fighting this battle, I felt a very real sense of the presence of God. It was comforting. It was strengthening. It was encouraging. And I never doubted for a moment that the manifestation was on its way. And then, guess what? The manifestation happened. I got well. I got healed. And I praised God. And I thanked him daily for a number of days. Likewise, I looked up some exercises to strengthen my core. And I had a doctor tell me, these are easy exercises. And they don't take long. You only have to do them for five or ten minutes a, a, a day. But, this was interesting. He says, you have to do them every day. And you have to do them forever. Big deal. And I'm thinking, to avoid the pain, the nightmare that I went through, I'm not going to do this for five minutes a day? And I did. I did them every day for maybe two or three months. And while I, of course, I didn't turn away from God and all that, but I wasn't daily thankful for that deliverance. Oh, God, I just want to thank you again that I'm upright today, that I can put my feet on the ground without feeling like I'm step, stepping on a live wire. Thank you, God, for simple flexibility and strength and health. I did for a while, and I did sometimes, but I didn't do it faithfully. I didn't walk with an awareness and a, con a conscious appreciation for it. And then almost a year to the day, Boom, I wake up and it's there again. Oh, it was just this horrible shaking. Oh, I can't. No, 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 no. But I know what I got to do. Go into battle mode. Got down on my knees, put my face in that couch and began to speak it. It's like, oh boy, you know. I, forgive me, Lord, for, for forgetting how important this is. It'll never happen again. Thank you, God, for healing me and speaking it over myself. Did it faithfully for a day, for a week for two weeks. And I have to tell you, I can't explain this. I'm just telling you how it was. During those two weeks, I did not feel the manifest presence of God. What it felt like was my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. 
I was not manifestly comforted by his presence. There was nothing except the daily diligence of speaking his word. I was not experiencing a, at least mentally, this assurance of victory. I was only going by the word, what I knew. That's the only thing that kept me speaking the word was because I knew it was the right thing to do. A completely different experience from that first go-round. And it was much more protracted. I still, I can't tell you exactly how long it lasted. But instead of a matter of days, it was a matter of weeks. And it was wearying. You know, don't you, any of you who've been through something like this, that it just drains your energy. Makes it difficult to be motivated to do anything. When I could walk, it was with a cane and I had to, you know, it was, oh my goodness. It was so tough and it reached a point uh, one Saturday night, uh, Friday night, I think we were having a youth group party that night and I'm sitting there in my chair trying to be comfortable. Uh, Riley was a baby, or real little anyway. Uh, and I can remember sitting there looking out the window and it has, it's snowing. Now I love cold weather, but I love snow. And this was the perfect snow. It's not five below zero and blowing. It's, it's probably 20 degrees outside, falling, massive, big, soft flakes, and it's falling down big. You can just see it piling up. And I wanted nothing more in that moment than to scoop my little son up and go outside and, and just walk in the snow, play in the snow, just enjoy it. And I'm sitting there in that chair, hardly able to walk. And then it hits me that Beth has taken on it such an extra load for the past few weeks because I just can't help her. I can't do anything. I can hardly do anything around the house. And I just start bawling. I'm sitting in my chair. I just start crying. And Beth would just come over. Bless her heart. She was so good about this. And I, I think I say this every time I share this testimony. Young people, marry somebody who is on the same sheet of music, music with you faith-wise. Oh, I would never marry a non-Christian. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about somebody who believes what you believe about the Word of God and healing and everything else because we are one flesh. The person who is most responsible for Scott Millis receiving his healing from the Word of God is Scott Millis. The second person, far above anybody else, any famous minister, anybody in the world who has authority over this body is Beth Millis. And so every time she came by, no matter how tired she was, no matter how whatever extra work, she'd just come by and just say, thank you, Lord, for healing my husband. Several times a day. Thank you that you love us, and thank you for healing Scott. Thank you that his back is getting strong. And now I start crying. She's like, what's wrong? And I said, I'm just feeling sorry for myself. I've just hit a breaking point. I'm doing everything I can. I'm not giving up. I know I'm healed. I just feel terrible. I feel so sad. I'm feeling sorry for myself. She goes, do you want to stay here while I go to the youth group party? I said, no. I said, I, the last thing I want to do is just be here alone, and, you know, uh, marinating in my own sadness and stuff. So I limped on down to the church and we make it through the party and I'm just sitting there hurting, watching everybody have a good time. And I came home and the next morning there was a uh, practice for the Christmas program. And she said, do you, you want to come down to the church? You want to stay? I said, I'm just going to come down there. I just got to get out of the house. I at least can see people, see children. It'll cheer me up a little bit. And I'm sitting out there in the lobby, just leaning on my cane while people are coming and going. And the men's prayer group uh, was coming out of the fellowship hall. And Roger Beals. And you know, the, the Proverbs talk about this. You know, when somebody's sad, uh, you know, that's not the person you, you can just go up to and say, hey, come on, buddy, cheer up and everything. There's, there's, certain, there's certain ways you got to approach people. You know, a, a joke at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And Roger, he can be so positive sometimes that I guess I'm just being... At that moment, I'm thinking, here comes Roger to talk to me. I'm not sure he's the one I want to hear from right now. <laughs> but Roger came over to me and he said, Pastor, you're here. I just wanted to tell you, we were just in men's prayer. And Ken Beatty, right before we left, he said, I just feel this strong leading of the Spirit. I'm just going to stand here in proxy for Pastor Scott. And I want you guys to lay hands on me and speak healing over him. Lay hands on me as if you were lay, laying hands on Pastor Scott. 
And we just spoke your healing. And as he's saying it, as Roger Beals is saying this, I had the closest thing to a vision that I have ever had. Which was I had this picture of me in a dark woods, swinging my sword, fighting the devil, fighting sickness, speaking the word with everything in me, and I had fallen down completely out of strength, this close to just giving up. And I turn around, and there are 20 strong men with their swords fighting with me. I think at one point I I reached the point where I could tell that story without crying, but it's been so long since I've told that whole story. But I was strengthened by that, again, I won't call it an open vision, but it was close because it hit me, this image hit me all at once. And Roger barely got those words out of his mouth, and I'm bawling, I'm sitting there with my cane, I'm just... (laughs) But it was cleansing. It was this joyous crying. And I got up, that, I left that day knowing that I was healed. And any shadow of a doubt that had tried to intrude was gone. And this, and I told you my prayers felt like they're bouncing off the ceiling that whole time. They had been. Suddenly the heavens were opened. Suddenly I knew God was hearing me. And, it, and, and, and praise the Lord, I woke up the very next morning. And my back still hurt. (laughs) And I woke up the next morning, Monday, and my back still hurt like crazy. It's no better. But man, I'm full of joy. I'm full of faith. And I'm still speaking. I'm still speaking. I woke up Tuesday morning. My back still hurt. I woke up Wednesday morning. My back still hurt. I woke up Thursday morning. The pain was gone. 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 I won't say I was 100% strong, but the pain was gone. And you talk about the relief, the manifest relief. Oh, praise God. I can walk. But much as important as that was, as important as what Ken did was, this was all part of what God was doing. You know what was just as important in that process? I never stopped speaking the word. Even when I wasn't feeling it. I knew it was true. Even though God wasn't flooding me with a, yes, God, I hear you, I'm working it in you, and I'm comforting you. Even though nothing was there, the word was still working. That thankfulness and that confession and that that, that, uh, being stable, and not changing, holding fast to your confession and your profession of faith is important for when those hard times come. It was also, I'll throw this in as a, as a footnote, a year later, still walking and healing, I get a letter, do you mind? Ken Beatty uh, drops off a letter. It wasn't just a note. It was a letter that he'd written out. Scott, I don't know if this has crossed your mind or not, but I've been praying for you, and I know that for the last two years, at this time of year, you've been slammed with a terrible uh, episode of sciatica, and I don't want you to be walking in fear. God has healed you. You are the healed of God. Don't for a minute fall into some trap of thinking this is going to happen every year. And wow, did it come at a great time? Because it was like, wow, I, I, I check, check myself. Uh, because that's a, that, boy, you can almost get superstitious about it, can't you? If you're not careful. Uh, and I wasn't. That wasn't something I was in danger of. But it was an encouragement to, hey, let's keep that confession ramped up. You know, this was the great thing about, about uh, was, who's the guy we just read about? Asa. <laughs> and by the way, it's interesting. You read about his father, uh, Abijah, I think, had a similar adventure where he went out to, to face a, a numerically superior foe and God delivered him. His son, Jehoshaphat, more famously, perhaps most famously, did the same thing. Here comes an enemy army. Let's put the praisers out front. We're going to fight this battle God's way and let God do the work. 
What's interesting is they were already keyed up for that. They were walking in God's word. They were walking in the light. They were doing everything they were supposed to do so that when an emergency came up, they didn't have to scramble and say, oh no, what now? Which was kind of like America pre-World War II. We got to ramp things up because we don't have a good, well-trained standing army. This is the whole argument about defense budgets, by the way. We're not at war. What do we need to be spending all this money on, on, on the military for? So that we're ready when it comes. Because it's going to come sometime. Maybe this week. You know, who knows? I'm not, I'm not going there. Uh, versus, fast forward a couple hundred years, King Josiah, who was also a good king. But the temple and the priesthood and the word itself had just withered. Nobody knew the word. Hardly anybody was pursuing God. And, and uh, Josiah, when somebody found it, you know, they were literally rebuilding the temple and blowing the dust off these scrolls. Josiah's like, he reads it and is like, my God, we're not doing any of this stuff. We've got to fix things. It's better to maintain than it is to fix and have to rebuild. And that's what we're doing with our confession, with our lives, and with Overall, I think the number one thing, the number one ingredient in that is thank you. Because when we are thanking God for the promise, we are expressing our faith in that promise. We should be just as thankful for the promise as we are for the manifestation. You can stand up and praise and worship team, you can come up here. Because, as I said, I want to lay hands on the sick. And I'm going to do something similar to what we did the last time, maybe the last two times. Uh, I will do, do, I'll do my best to hear from God. And if there's something he wants me to, something else he wants me to say or do, I'll do it. But my intention is simply just to, I'm just joining my faith with yours. There's nothing magical about my touch. There's nothing mystical about the oil uh, when we use oil. It's simply obedience to God. I'm just joining my faith with yours. When I touch you, when I put my hands on you, it's just a point of contact for our faith in that moment. Us don't make anything more out of it than it is, but we are obeying God. But when I do that, don't sit there and wait. Don't sit there and say, did I feel something? Did I feel a jolt? Some people do. I mean, God can, God can do anything through any one of us. And if I lay my hands on you and something happens and you, you conk out, that's fine. But this isn't one of those... If you didn't fall down, you didn't get it, churches, right? It ain't about that. It ain't about what you feel in the moment. It's about us agreeing with God's word in this moment. And so when I say, be healed, which might be all I say, or receive your healing, you say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for healing me. Thank you, Jesus. I receive that healing. Say something vocalize your gratitude for what God has done. Not what, he, not what you're waiting for him to do, but what he has promised it, because God promising it is just as good as God doing it. Amen? Also, even more important than that, as important as healing is, and that's another thing that we established, try, uh, tried to establish, is healing is important uh, it's, of course it's important because Jesus spent so much time doing it and we want to model him. or you, you know, He modeled that behavior for us and we want to imitate him. But also because sickness touches us in so many ways. If the devil can steal your health, he practically automatically is, is beginning to steal your finances too. It's hard to work when you're sick. It's hard not to spend money on doctors and medicine when you're sick. You have to, we have to do these things. So, and what else does it do? Robs us of our energy. Uh, robs us of our freedom. I was going to go on such and such a trip. I was going to serve in such and such a way. Can't. I'm sick. I'm broken. I'm hurting. Whatever. God wants us healthy because he loves us like any good father loves his children. He wants us healthy because he's got jobs for us to do that require us to be healthy. Amen? Amen. But God has another plan for us. The ultimate plan God has for us is for us to live, to rule, and reign with Jesus forever. There really is a heaven and there really is a hell after this life. As important as everything we are doing from day to day is, this life is important. It's vanishing away. It's like a vapor. Your whole life is like a vapor that appears for a while and vanishes away in the scope of eternity. Eternity is what we have to contend with. And the only thing that we have 
you know, always play that little game. It's a good, it's a good conversation starter when you want to find, locate where somebody is or if you believe, think they're a non-believer. Do you believe in heaven? Yeah. Do you believe in God? Yeah. If you were standing before God today, if you died today, and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? What's your answer? Because there literally is only one correct answer to that. If your answer starts with, well, because I, you're already on the way to the wrong answer. Unless you follow it with, I received Jesus Christ's <laughs> sacrifice as, as payment for my sin. Now, the answer is that. Why should you let me in? Really, if it were up to me, if it's based on me, you shouldn't. But you promised you would because of Jesus. Why should you let me in? Because Jesus said I could come. Jesus told me I could come. Jesus is the one who qualified me. Why should you let me in? Because Jesus is in there and I am in Christ. It is his finished work on the cross that was necessary to save all of us. There's not a single person who didn't need that to happen if we're going to be saved, if we're going to be righteous before God. So he did it. He didn't die on that cross. <laughs> it was a lot uglier. But he died that death so that anybody, everybody could be saved. But not everybody will be. Only those who say, I needed that. I can't save myself. I can never be good enough for God, but Jesus was. And I can be in him. I receive that. Here's what. Talk about the power of speaking. We're talking about not just feeling thankful, but expressing our thanks. And again, we're going to get into this in focus it on other things besides healing over the next couple of weeks. The, the importance of vocalizing that, the importance of speaking, the power of our words, that's woven all through Scripture. There's power in the tongue. And Paul said this, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Our confession leads to salvation. It will also lead to healing. But if there's anybody who has never made that confession of faith before, you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, today's your day. If you know enough now, whether you knew enough when you came in here, you know enough now to be saved. Well, surely there's more to it than that. There is more to the Christian life than that. There's not much more to salvation than that. It's got to start there. Once he saves you, once you surrender your life to him and say, you, yeah, I... I can't do this on my own, so Lord, you take over. I give you my life. You gave me yours. I give mine to you. It's yours. You do what you want with it. Then he's got a great plan, and it, and it gets great. I mean, it's, it, I'll say this. It's fun. It's fulfilling. It's, it's, uh, it really does. It, it is the literal meaning of life. I'll tell you this, too. It's not easy. It can still be great. It's full of joy, and again, even fun but not easy. And yet, we're doing this thing right. We're doing it in his power. Even the hard things can seem, uh, well, certainly less burdensome, but at times even easy. Sometimes we get through something very hard and look back and say, how did I get through that? Because he's carrying us. We're going through in his power. You know enough to get saved. If you desire to be saved, I want you to come up here and let me pray with you. I'm going to pray a prayer. And when I'm done praying, they're going to sing. And when they start singing, you come up here. Come up here for healing. If you come up here, I'm probably going to, because I know most of you, there's a handful here that I don't recognize. I know most of you, and I'm going to assume you're up here for healing. If you're up here for salvation, try to aim for this area. It doesn't matter. But when I get to you, say I go to lay my hand on you, you grab my hand and say, Scott, I need to be saved. Pray for me. And I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer. You don't even have to make it up. You can repeat after me, and as long as you mean it, God will hear it. You'll be saved. You'll be a Christian. You will be born again into the family of, of, of God. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for healing. Thank you for your precious promises. And help us to claim those, to walk in those, to receive them manifestly into our lives. But Lord, forgive us, especially those of us who have received that awesome manifestation of your work in our lives, particularly when it comes to healing or anything else, and yet have not daily been thankful for it. We take it for granted and we just want to live in way and, and we wait for the next crisis for you to bail us out again. Thanks for the times you've bailed us out, Lord God, but keep us mindful of just how good you've been and uh, help us to uh, keep a guard over our mouths so that we don't say the wrong things 
and that you uh, speak through us so that we do things and say the things that need to be said so we can, because we can preach to ourselves, remind ourselves, stir ourselves up uh, and encourage ourselves that you are the God who loves us because you're the God who healed us. You're the God who provides for us and protects us. Thank you for all of that, Lord. It's my prayer, Lord, that if there's anybody in here who does not know you as Father, that have never come into that saving relationship with you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that you would convict them of their need to make that decision today and grant them the boldness, the wisdom, and the humility to make that decision today. And thank you that your power to heal is manifest in our midst according to your promise, the gifts of the Spirit, gifts of healings, uh, signs, wonders, and healings and miracles in our midst even today, Lord God, to meet the needs that you say you have already met in Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. God bless you as you come.